Oh, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about Brexit. Hands up who knows what Brexit means? Because I don't. So we're going to explore some of the issues around how we got to here, uh, what Brexit means, what it might mean, but also, importantly, the implications for business and therefore the implications for policyholders um, and the implications for our role as adjusters. I've got about 30 slides, most of which don't have words on because I prefer pictures. This, this particular cartoon is one or two, it's actually a year old, but it, you know, I don't think we've moved forward since then, actually. Um, it's the horses charging into, I don't know what, but we're on a mission to charge into something, and I don't think anyone's really got a great idea in terms of where we're going. Um, I pulled this out of the Institute of Risk Management's magazine. Um, I thought it was quite a good summary as to what business thinks of Brexit at the moment. This comes from two surveys, a Deloitte survey and a KPMG survey. 43%, so less than half of UK businesses say they've assessed Brexit risks. This is recent data as well, it's not old data. So the majority of UK businesses uh, admit to not assessing Brexit risk. 29%, less than one third, have made plans for leaving the EU. Maybe that's because they don't think it'll happen. Maybe they don't know what it means. Maybe none of us know what it means. And 21% or less than one quarter say that they're willing to explore new markets. I don't know what the figure would have been pre the Brexit referendum for that one though. You know, it's interesting to speculate. Even though 8% or less than 8% of chief financial officers expect a positive outcome from Brexit. So generally gloomy view from UK business that it's going to go well. 43% um, say the top worry is economic and financial uncertainty. The most trivial Brexit risk, the price of a full English breakfast could rise by 13%. Um, this just reinforces the fact that in this green and pleasant land here in the UK, we import three quarters of our food. So the price of a, bre of a breakfast will increase. So how did we get here? Oh, we lost the bottom off the slide. That font I chose deliberately, it's called um, French Roman. Um, I thought it was an appropriate font to use for some of the slides here. We share so much across Europe and have done for many, many years. Um, chatting before this presentation, I was saying to some people that um, I had my genes tested recently and I discovered that I'm 80% Anglo-Saxon. In, in other words, 80% German. Um, I'm 10% Irish or West Coast Scottish. And I'm 10% Northern Spain or Portuguese. And we can't really work out in the family where that's come from. My wife's done a similar test, and it turns out she's 50% Scandinavian um, and 30% French. Uh, the remaining 20% is sort of British. But I think in this country, most people would be surprised where we come from. You know, Europe's a small continent. How did we get here? Well, the fascinating thing is we've actually been here before, in a way. Um, not leaving the EU, but, you know, I'm not quite this old. Um, well, I am actually. 1957. Uh, this gentleman is Harold Macmillan, uh, UK Prime Minister at the time, known as Supermac. Um, the common market, as it was called, so the EU today, had been formed. Group of six countries, France, Germany, Italy and the Benelux countries and they set up a free trade area. Now Macmillan thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to negotiate a deal with this free trade area? Not to join them, because we don't want any of this foreign, for, foreign funny business. We don't want to be part of Europe. We want a free trade agreement with Europe. That was his view, his government's view, and the view in the country at the time. 
why did he want a free trade agreement rather than join the common market? Well, he had this idea that it would be great to have great trade deals with other countries around the world, particularly Commonwealth countries, ex-British Empire countries. That was, the, that was the thinking at the time. Now, the EU weren't going to have, common market weren't going to have any of this. Um, Macmillan wasn't a skilled negotiator. His prime negotiating style was the use of threats. So he said, unless you give us a free trade deal, we're going to remove the British Army of the Rhine. You know, at that time, Britain was providing a lot of security on what was the common market's eastern border. Conrad Adenauer, um, Adenauer the German Chancellor at the time, called his bluff. He said, I don't care if you're going to threaten us with something, we're not going to do it. We don't see any benefit in giving Britain a free trade deal. So they turned us down. Um, we didn't strike a free trade deal with Europe and another almost 20 years passed before we finally we joined what was then the European Economic Community. Um, not everything's the same as that today. We happen to have a thriving financial services sector around us here in London. Uh, that's important not just from our point of view as providers of those services from London but London is the key provider of finance to European institutions. So if Europe wants to prop up governments across Europe, where do they come for finance? They come to London. So we're really important here in London to the European Central Bank. So some things have changed. Other things have changed. At the time when all this went on, the USA were very keen to maintain a strong united Europe mainly as a, um, a bulwark, bulwark against what they considered to be a communist threat from Russia. Um, under Mr. Trump in the USA now, you know, it's easy to argue that none of that applies, but um, we don't know how long Mr. Trump's still going to be president for, do we? So that could all change again, and if it does change in the US, we're likely to have a US government across the pond who feel, yep, Europe needs to be working together as closely as possible. So, it's not new. So how did we get here? Well, let's just go back one. The facts are that one third of the country voted to leave the European Union, one third voted to remain, and one third didn't vote, more or less. Um, the majority was 1.3 million um, in favour of those who wish to leave. 12.9 million didn't vote. Um, the analysts say that if we re-ran exactly the same question with exactly the same information in another three years time, so in 2021, the re result would come out in favour of remaining purely because Older people, by and large, voted to leave, and younger people, by and large, voted to remain. So you've got that demographic shift that would lead to a completely different result if the vote was rerun in three years' time. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because we don't sit still on the 8th of February 2018, the world moves on, and therefore the British people will be as a grouping, um, changing their view over time, purely because there are likely to be more Leave voters dying than there are Remain, vo remain voters entering the electorate. Um, tremendous disagreements across the UK on this subject. Uh, we have family in Yorkshire and I have friends in Northumberland, so up on the UK's uh, northeast coast and I've been told not to bring up the subject of Brexit in that part of the country because I'll be lynched. Um, the very, very strong feelings against what is called Europe, but really it's not Europe, it's against central government in London. So that's some of the background to how we've got here. So anyway, that, that might be interesting, but what do we do about it? Well, if you're going to have a good project, this comes from the International Project Management Association, who I've had quite a bit to do with in the past. 
Um, these are just seven key points on a good project. So we can judge for ourselves whether Brexit as a concept is a good project. First of all, you need a clear and compelling rationale. None of this soft emotional stuff. The rationale for a good project must be it must solve a problem or seize an opportunity. Okay? The second one is you need a clear, strong and energetic, charismatic sponsor behind a good project. Um, Obama only managed to get the Affordable Care Act through in the States because he was that strong, charismatic sponsor and had the ability to carry people with him um, in taking that project forward. Um, where are the clear, charismatic sponsors for Brexit? There has to be buy-in from key stakeholders. So it's interesting, when the Olympics were held in London, um, almost 100% of the country were behind that project. You know, everyone wanted it to happen, so it happened. Uh, we said earlier that one third of the country were in favour of Brexit happening. Um, or equally, you could argue that one third of the country were against Brexit happening. So we don't have you know, massive opinion saying it's got to happen. And we need clarity of scope. We need to understand what Brexit means. And at the moment, we don't know what Brexit means. We've got no idea what it actually means. We need a precise finish line. So those of us who are slightly older will remember President Kennedy. Well, actually, I was told by my parents this happened. Um, at the beginning of the 1960s, he said, we want to start a program to put a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. Clear finish date. We don't have a clear finish date for Brexit. Um, we have a date. We have a date of the 29th of March next year when Britain will leave the European Union. That isn't the finish date. That's just the date at which Britain starts the process of leaving the European Union. A lot will need to happen after that. And we need the resources to do it. Uh, the newspapers have carried a huge amount of press on the, um, the fact that the Department for International Trade here in the UK don't have the staff to take this forward. And I don't know about all of you, but when I'm planning something in my private life, I will reconsider as I go through, depending upon what information comes to life comes to light. We live in a changing world, so good project management says you need flexibility. So if one were to apply this doctrine to Brexit, the final point on that side is really important. Because we don't know what the scope is, because four is not yet clear, flexibility is really important. And there's a heck of a lot happening in the wider world to take into account as well. Brexit is not the only game in town, it's actually quite a small one. So, what we're going to do now is talk a bit about how we prepare for all of this. And, um, yeah, we're going to talk a bit about uncertainty and risk. Because this is classic uncertainty. Um, uncertainty is defined as external and internal factors that might impact an organisation to achieve its objectives. So and I've given some examples there and you probably guess, yeah, this is a slide I use all the time and I've just put the word Brexit on the bottom because it's uncertainty. Actually, uncertainty doesn't always matter. It's not always important. It could have rained this morning, um, but would that have affected any of us getting here? So it's an uncertainty, but it's not really a risk. Risk, and this is Dr. David Hilson, a colleague of mine who calls himself the risk doctor. Um, as far as I can work out, it's because he looks like a doctor. Um, David will say risk arises from interactions between objectives, so what you want to happen. And remember, when we're talking about Brexit, we don't know what we want to happen. You know, it hasn't been defined yet. And uncertainty, what might happen. Well, lots of things might, might happen. Therefore, risk is uncertainty that matters. On that basis, Brexit probably is a risk, but we all knew that anyway. So one way of showing this graphically, and I prefer pictures, we live in a world of uncertainty. The world would be boring without uncertainty. Um, risk is a subset of that, and we should always remember that there's an upside to risk as well as a downside. 
you know, it's easy to think about things that can go wrong, but it's also easy to think about things that can go right. Uh, we go into business to take risk because we're going to achieve something through the opportunity side of risk. So going back to that slide, we're just going to talk a little bit about the opportunities and threats that might fl flow from Brexit and what we can do about them. Right, okay, I've noticed that I've put question marks after each of these. And when we get onto the threats slide, there'll be question marks after all of those. And the real key point I wanted to get over this morning is nobody really knows anything about these circumstances around so-called Brexit. We don't know what it means yet. So we can talk about cheaper exports. Um, yeah, it's true, the pound has lost um, 15 percent now. It was 20 percent, it's back up to 15 percent against the euro. Um, I think that's probably the right figure. And my understanding is against the US dollar, we're roughly back to where we were when the referendum happened. Now whether that's because um, Brexit is looking better from a UK perspective or whether there's a level of nervousness in the US and the dollar has slid, I'm not sure. But okay, so cheaper exports and access to new market. How is all this going to happen? Well if you read the press and watch the media and go on the web, uh, you'll get the impression that we can sign up for something called World Trade Association terms. Britain isn't actually a member of the WTO. Um, that doesn't seem to get talked about a great deal by the media, but we're not a member. Interestingly, all the other European Union countries, I believe, are members of the WTO, but because of a quirk of history, we never became members. So, okay, so we fill in a form and we join. It's simple. Actually, you don't even need to fill in a form. You go on their website, click the button, and you've become a member. Well, it doesn't work like that. The WTO is the slowest organisation known to man and womankind. Um, for instance, the 2001 Doha Round of free trade talks haven't been, hasn't been agreed yet. So it's 17 years of discussion since those talks started. Uh, that's a sign of how slow the WTO is to reach decisions. So you think, okay, the WTO will be happy to sign Britain up as a member, and then somehow between the WTO, the British government, and 27 other European governments, to divide up trade uh, from what was the EU's WTO license between all those different countries. It's going to take a very, very long time for any of those opportunities to come forward. Um, end to subsidising competitors or potential competitors elsewhere in Europe. Yes, we won't be spending money as a country. Um, we won't be net contributors to the European Union budget. However, we'll have to be funding many of those services that we're getting from Europe here um, separately, so the money will be spent. I come originally from part of the southwest of England called Cornwall. I, as a Cornishman, I find it surprising that Cornwall voted overwhelmingly to leave the EU. Now, if you've ever been to Cornwall, there's one thing to know about Cornwall, apart from that it's got good sailing. Um, Tourists come to Cornwall for two months of the year and for the other ten months of the year it rains and it's very windy. So huge amount of income comes in through tourism for two months of the year. The rest of the year, how do people survive? Well, they're funded by the EU. But those same people voted to leave the EU, mainly because it's not really well known in Cornwall that they're being funded by the EU. So, you know, another one of those uncertainties coming in. So I mention that because whilst we may get some money back by not spending money by contributing to the European Union budget, that ignores the fact that we're going to have to be spending some of that money. You know, we can't allow Cornwall or parts of South Wales or other parts of the U United Kingdom to go bankrupt effectively, so we're going to have to pay for that. And that's before one considers transitional arrangements. Freedom from regulation, yep, but you can bet your bottom dollar that uh, that regulation will be replaced by other regulation. I do some consulting work on the general data protection regulations that are 
It's a European-wide initiative to replace the various data protection acts across Europe with one unified set of legislation. Um, that's all happening at the moment. Do you know who's driving it? It's the German and British data protection offices. So, you know, just because we're leaving the EU, it doesn't mean that that sort of regulation is going to disappear. Because we and the German, we the British and the Germans want this more than anyone. So it's going to happen anyway. Um, if we're going to be exporting goods and services around Europe, we'll have to sign up to European standards. So my own personal opinion is that the freedom from regulation is probably illusory. And I've put the bottom slide, bottom bullet point on this slide deliberately. I mean, as you travel around this country, it's very easy to get the impression that if you just go to certain parts of the country, and I don't think it is a north-south divide, I think it's an east-west divide. If you go to the richer parts of the country, so the southeast of England, the West Midlands, and the northwest, um, they've benefited from growth of the British economy over the last few years. I find it fascinating that the BBC, when they talk about the North, they always talk about Manchester. Well, Manchester's actually an honorary part of the South of England. I get lynched for saying that in Manchester, but it's a rich city. The poor parts of the United Kingdom are the far southwest, so Cornwall, and the east. If you travel up the A1, the main road from London up to Edinburgh, you pass through um, a scene of urban dereliction, you know, lack of employment. It's all of those parts of the country who've suffered. They haven't gained the benefits, reaped the benefits of Britain's growth over the last few decades. So it's people in those parts of the country who voted against. Um, if Brexit brings the benefits that are promised by the Brexiteers, maybe it will lead to less social tension between people living in that part of, the, of Britain and other parts of Britain. Um, but I'd guess that that probably needs an initiative from central government here in London to do something about it. So what about the threats? More expensive imports. The dreadful thing about getting older is you have to keep putting your glasses on, which I find incredibly annoying. Um, just looking at trade in manufactured goods, uh, the UK currently imports 292 billion US dollars worth of manufactured goods. We export 177 billion dollars. So we import a lot more than we export. Um, Brexit's going to hit us with that. Labour shortages. Um, I have a son, one son, who is an engineer. He works for a major international engineering company based here in London. And um, in his office, he's an electrical engineer by trade. In his office, they have 24 people, two from China, two from India, uh, four from the United Kingdom. Where do the other 16 come from? Across Europe. We've, and this is not unusual. If you go into en major engineering companies based in the United Kingdom, you'll find a lot of engineers come to Britain because we haven't been breeding engineers over the last few years. Oh. Sorry, just touch the mouse on the um, hmm? Right. Uh -huh. We're back on. Okay. Right. Did I yeah, drop. Yeah, I wonder where that went. It wasn't a conjuring trick. Yeah. So, labour shortages, particularly in the areas of engineering and medicine, uh, we rely heavily as a country here in the United Kingdom on people from across the world and particularly from across Europe. If you remove their ability to travel freely to this country to work, we're going to have a problem. Um, it's going to affect our social services, our health services. It's also going to affect our ability to operate, um, particularly in the engineering and science field. Um, let alone affect those companies who are employing cheap labour, either from Europe or elsewhere in the world, by bringing cheap labour in 
from Europe. That's actually not a European issue. It's a UK government issue because the UK government allows companies to employ people at really low rates. Possibly more red tape. We talked under, when we were talking about opportunities about, you know, potentially you can replace European legislation with the need to comply with European legislation because we're exporting to Europe, but to have our own legislation for UK domestic purposes and probably reduced growth. It's not me saying this. Uh, the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, um, are currently saying that we're expecting to lose three to five and a half percent of GDP in the United Kingdom by 2020. Um, and I was reading my newspaper on the way to work this morning and um, never believe what you read in the press, <laughs> but article in here. Um, I'm not sure who this is accredited to. Yeah, it's a government, right, government report which says everywhere in the UK could be worse off after Brexit. Fascinatingly, they're suggesting that the worst affected regions will be the northeast of England, um, who voted the most positively for Brexit, which would see a 16% reduction um, in um, wealth under a no deal outcome, an 11% reduction if a free trade deal with Europe is struck, and a 3% reduction if the UK stays in the single market. Um, by contrast, London is predicted to take the least damage with a 3.5% reduction in trade after a no deal agreement, 2% with a free trade agreement, and 1% by staying in the single market. Now, London voted overwhelmingly to stay in the EU. The North East voted overwhelmingly to pull out of the EU. Um, it's a cruel twist of fate that if this report is correct, it's the North East that's going to suffer the most. Leading to more social tension. You know, if you've got less wealth, that can lead to more social tension. Um, if you're a student of international geography and international history, I find it fascinating that countries break up when their economies are going down the pan. So um, Slovakia broke away from the Czech Republic uh, for reasons that, that they felt that Slovakia was being overly dominated by the Czech Republic and therefore they set up on their own and that led to an immediate reduction in, um, the, in Slovakia's trade with the rest of the world. Um, so what do we know and what don't we know? Um, when I've talked through opportunities and threats, we've talked about the reduction in the value of the pound against other major currencies. Um, that's probably the one hard fact we have about Brexit. We know what's happening. Um, number two, wealth. We don't know whether Brexit will lead to um, an impover impoverishment of the UK economy or an enrichment of the UK economy. Nobody can predict that. We can guess what might happen, but we can't actually uh, sign on the line and say that's what's going to happen. Um, we do know that as a country we rely heavily on both skilled and unskilled workers from across the rest of Europe. But because we don't know what form Brexit will take, we don't know what will happen with the workforce and what the implications for that might be. On the regulatory front, again, we don't know. We can guess various things might happen, but at the moment there's very little hard evidence. And when it comes to markets, you know, okay, the government have currently said we're not going to be part of the single market. And I think they said this week they're not going to be part of the customs union. Uh, the EU Customs Union. But let's see. Uh, my understanding is that UK car makers are meeting with the government today here in London to discuss this very subject. So until you know, we're a bit further down the track, we don't know where we'll be in terms of our ability to market both goods and services, particularly financial services, throughout Europe. Lots of unknowns. Now risk management's useful here. Um, if you ignore all the stuff around the edge of the cycle here, there are three key components to 
risk managing an issue. The first is to understand the scope, to understand what you're dealing with, both internally and externally, before you then assess risk and then do something about it. So you think in your own life when you're dealing with risk, the process you go through is to think about you know, how is this happening and where is it happening and what are the fairest factors, then actually to look at the risk but then to do something about it and it is a circular process. I'm not going to talk all about that but I am going to talk about scope for Brexit. So this helps us as practitioners and as companies understand what we're dealing with. Um, what does Brexit, Brexit actually mean? Well, we don't know at the moment. You know, we haven't been told. It's still being worked out. Hopefully we'll find out this year. Leaving the EU, yes, that's almost a definite. If Britain uh, Brexit, Britain exiting, is Britain exiting the European Union? Yep, that's definitely going to happen, probably. Leaving the single market. If I were a betting man, I'd say that's probably going to happen as well. Leaving the customs union, we don't yet really know. The government's made an announcement this week, but we don't really know. The European Court of Justice, the government has said, and that's a, that's a part of the European, or it's aligned with the European Union, the government has said, yes, we will leave the European Court of Justice uh, when we leave the European Union. However, interestingly, the European Court of Human Rights, which is a completely separate entity to the European Court of Justice, uh, we have no plans to leave at the moment. And those two institutions work hand in glove. So I'm not quite sure where that leaves us, where it leaves Britain as a country, or Europe without Britain, if Britain is still a member of the European Court of Human Rights, which we are, but not part of the European Court of Justice. If you ask the government about this subject, they will say that um, we've got too much legislation going through Parliament at the moment. We'll think about the European Court of Human Rights once Brexit's agreed. We'll deal with that later. What about NATO and what about Euratom? I'm not sure what the answer is on Euratom, actually, um, whether we've decided to leave that entity or not. NATO we've decided not to leave. But I think there's an interesting comparison. I was talking to some French last week in, in the Alps, and they were saying to me, well, bear in mind that France left NATO back in the, I think it was 60s or 70s, um, and then 20 years later reconsidered and rejoined. You know, so it is known for countries to leave international institutions and then rejoin. Uh, but at the moment, we're not leaving NATO. Um, pet passports, didn't put them on the list. And of course, the one that most people care most of all about, the Eurovision Song Contest, isn't on the list. Um, and my understanding is we're not leaving that either. So if you understand the scope, it then helps you understand the risk. And at the moment, the scope is unclear. So it's very hard to assess the risk, let alone do anything about it until the scope is clear. So what we should all be doing is trying to get answers to these questions because until we get answers to these questions, we can't really do anything. Now, of course, Brexit's not happening, happening in a vacuum. If you pick up British newspapers, you might think it's the most important show in town. It's not. It's, a, it's um, a comparative sort of blip on the horizon. There are other things happening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about known and unknown knowns and knowns and unknowns. Um, that sounds a bit tortuous, but we'll explain that in a moment. We're going to talk a bit about emerging global risks more generally, um, the changing nature of markets, um, complex businesses, and some useful techniques to survive. Um, this is Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of State for Defence in the United States, and at a conference in Brussels, um, before the 9-11 attacks said this, there are no knowns, there are things that we know we know. Um, this was, there are also known unknowns, that's to say there are things that we now know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. Um, there are things that we do not know that we don't know. Um, quite profound for a Secretary of State for Defence. Brexit actually falls into the um, Second category, I believe, it's a known unknown. 
Uh, we know that it's there, but we don't know what it is. Um, the other one that he didn't mention, so he's not that clever after all, is he didn't talk about unknown knowns. Now, in business, these are the things that you just don't know about because you haven't gone out and found out about them. And to some extent, Brexit falls into that category as well because it's an evolving subject. You know, we need to go out and find out what information might be out there um, in order to work out what to do about it. Um, we are living through what some people call VUCA times, um, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. There's a lot changing in the world. Some people refer to the current time that we're in as the fourth industrial revolution. You know, it's an important. And what does that mean? Well, it means there's a lot changing. And I'm not going to talk about all of this, but what I am going to do is just touch on the technological box here. You know, if we think Brexit's important, remember the figures I was quoting were billions. Um, Gartner Group, who are probably the world's most acknowledged technology consultants, uh, commentators, uh, said that last year the world spent 3.5 trillion, not billion, 3.5 trillion, trillion US dollars on IT last year. And you think about your own lives, the advent of things like Siri on your phone, Alexa in the house, um, your internet connected kettle being used as part of someone's botnet to hack into industrial control systems, augmented reality, uh, the fact that the world's biggest taxi company, Uber, has no taxis, the world's biggest two shopping companies, Alibaba and Amazon, have no shops, and the world's biggest hotels group, we all know which one that is, Airbnb, have no hotels. These sorts of changes are much more major than the sorts of changes that Brexit's likely to bring. Why do I mention all of this? Well, we've got to look at Brexit in the context of what's going on in the wider world. So all those things matter. Um, I find it fascinating that Westminster, the UK government, are talking about rebalancing the UK economy away from services and into manufacturing. That's just at the time when the rest of the world is moving in the opposite direction. Um, if one didn't know better, one would think that the UK's current government are on a, a mission to drive the UK back to the monochrome 1970s. I was alive in the monochrome 1970s and it wasn't a good place to be. Don't want to go back there. In, the, in this new world, the new technological world, collaboration is absolutely key. The firms I've mentioned only work through collaboration and use of technology. Whatever type of Brexit we end up with, it's got, to, it's got to reflect this world rather than a monochrome 1970s manufacturing orientated world. Uh, PwC estimate that one third of UK jobs will be automated by the next 15 years. Other commentators reckon that those PwC figures are a bit on the light side and actually it could be a lot more than 15%, uh, th one, more than 33%. So that's the world we're in. So when we're talking about labour shortages, let's think about you know, what's likely to happen to those sorts of jobs. Um, and how we want the future to be. Um, there's a lot of advice on this sort of thing. This document was released, what, a couple of weeks ago from the World Economic Forum, Forum, the Global Risk Report. You probably can't read that that easily, but the risks that we should worry about are those up here. Brexit's not on there anywhere. These are, this is the world's view as to what the really big risks are. And what we've got up here are classic things like extreme weather events. We know about those. As, as adjusters, natural disasters. These are still the things with the biggest likelihood and the biggest impact. Um, failure of climate change mitigation and adaptations, our inability to deal with climate change. Uh, the one that's crept up in recent years is this one, cyber attacks with data fraud and theft here. Biodiversity, why does that matter? Well, it matters because where do our medicines come from? They, ultimately, they come from plant products. 
um, so it does affect us as human beings. Um, scarcity of resources, so we've got water crises there and food crises. These are the things that matter most. The report goes on, this is just one page from the report, but it goes on to say that these sorts of issues can only be resolved through cooperation um, between nations. Um, we'll skip through, we'd have hours on this, but... And the other thing to bear in mind when we're looking at Brexit is that the world isn't just a simple world anymore of businesses taking goods or services from suppliers and supplying them to customers. Um, it tends to be a bit more like this. Um, and in a European world, each of these entities tend to be in different countries. So whatever we want for emotional reasons, uh, we have to reflect on the fact that if you're building vehicles, for instance, um, in today's Europe, whether Britain is in or out of the European Union, components are going to be coming from across Europe, indeed across the world, and finished products sent out across Europe, across the world. Um, and the government box on here, I guess, when we move to a Brexit world, there'll be several governments. It won't just be one European government. It will be several regulators. How do we deal with all of this? We deal with it by understanding complexity. Brexit is complex. Um, and there's simple ways of dealing with these things. Understanding your own business or your client's business and its risks. You can't understand the impact that Brexit's going to have um, on your client's business or your own business until you understand that business and its risks. Have the right information, but also importantly, understand how the outside world is changing. So all the things I touched on around technology and changing trends across the world are really important in the context of Brexit. Um, don't just look at magnitude and likelihood when looking at risk, the classic way of looking at risk, but also risk velocity, so how quickly something that might have been a tiny little risk escalates to become a really, really important one. And risk interconnectedness. So the sad thing about the world, or the exciting thing <coughs> about the world, is that you pull one lever and it affects something somewhere else. You know, the old adage about a butterfly flapping its wings in China has a big effect on climate in South America. Um, avoiding groupthink, so getting groups of people together to try and solve the issues around Brexit help. Um, and seeking knowledge, knowledge from others or new, or new research, knowing who to believe rather than what to believe. Um, that report I referred to today, uh, earlier in today's newspaper, who knows whether that's correct. I don't have all the appropriate provenance for it to be able to say, yep, that's going to happen or it's not going to happen but by taking a range of opinions, we're more likely to make the right decisions. Now I'm going to leave you with just a few tools that we can use in order to help find our way out of this mess. Um, scenario planning was invented by the US Department of Defense in the 1950s. You know, the great thing about wars, well there is no great thing about a war, but the great thing about wars from a business sense is you don't ever know what the outcome's going to be. Brexit's a bit like that. So the US Department of Defense came up with quite a simple concept to say, look, okay, if things are going to turn out how we think, then we'll do this. That's the straight line along the middle. However, things could be brighter than we think, in which case we do the upward curving line. And they may turn out more badly than we think, in which case the downward curve, curving line. Um, a lot of organisations that I work with are now using these techniques in their business planning cycle. Gone are the days when you say, right, that's my mission statement, that's what I'm going to do, and you know, that's the plan to do it. We're in a Brexit world where a lot can change, and none of us know how it's going to turn out. Therefore, we need to plan for each of those scenarios. We need to think about what's going to happen, if Brexit just doesn't happen, it be cancelled tomorrow, or at the opposite extreme, what happens if we have a hard Brexit, where the UK effectively pulls out of all European institutions, pulls up the drawbridge, so to speak, cuts off the Channel Tunnel, and uh, becomes a 
isolated state off the north coast of Europe. Now that's not going to happen, probably, but we should consider all the different uh, possibilities in between. Um, one thing that helps here is building in resilience into our business. You know, because we don't know what's going to happen, uh, that's why the concept of business continuity planning or business resilience exists. It says something could happen, but we don't know what, so this is what we'll do to protect ourselves. Um, the human body has a great way of doing this by duplicating key functions. I mean, we all have two ears and two eyes so that to give us stereoscopic vision and stereoscopic or stereo, yeah, I'm not sure what the word is for that, but stereoscopic hearing, um, stereophonic hearing, I should say. Um, but if we lose one ear or one eye, we've still got some residual function left. Why do we have two kidneys? The only reason we have two kidneys um, is that we have a spare, so that if something goes wrong, we've got another one there. It's a classic example of resilience. Someone who wasn't an accountant, and I'm aware we've got accountants in the room, did say to me that if they gave the subject of designing the human body to an accountant, you know, they'd say, surely it's a lot more efficient to have um, only one kidney, because it's lighter you know, less weight to carry around. In fact, what they'd do is not have one each, we'd have one in the, on the table here, in the middle of the room, and we could each plug into it and turn. So that's called outsourcing. And you know, you don't use your kidneys the whole time, you just use them from time to time. So why not do that? Well, the reason we as a species are still here is that we've got that built-in resilience. It gives us the ability to survive crises and things that we don't know about. Build the same sort of resilience into your businesses. And carry out impact assessments. Um, dear old David Davis, uh, did anyone see David Davis on TV? The UK's Minister for Ex Exiting the EU, who when asked what impact assessments the government had carried out um, on the impact of Brexit, basically said we haven't done any. Um, I've been told by Someone I know in the House of Lords that he has a pet name, David Davis, at the House of, in, in Parliament. It's Lazy Davis. He's been known for not actually seeing through anything he's ever proposed in the past, but do impact assessments. So this is just a summary of some of the things we've talked about. Com complex landscapes, understanding who to believe as well as what, so being sure about your sources. There's a lot of fake news out there, great term that. Don't forget the bigger picture. Recognise complexity and emerging trends and emerging risks. Carry out the impact assessments. Don't just lie about them. Be excellent in the way you communicate what you know and what you don't know around your organisation. Build in resilience, two kidneys, not one. Embed thinking about risk within your business. And a great way is actually building diversity. I mean. There's so a lot of stuff in the media at the moment about equal gender diversity, but not just diversity of gender in organisations, diversity in every possible way. Having different mindsets at the table can help a lot when it comes to dealing with a complex subject. And finally, challenging conventional thought, avoiding groupthink, and thinking the unthinkable. Just because you don't want something to happen doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, and there's only one way to avoid risk, which is that way. You know, the great thing about being a human being is we encounter risk every day and it's exciting. Um, so that's me. And th thank you for your attention this morning. <laughs>